Well, my name is Nick Boltink, and I have the humble privilege to serve you here as an elder at Redeemer Bible Church. And it's also an honor to be up here today in front of you all preaching from the pulpit. Uh, it's not an honor that I take lightly. Pastor Vic and the other elders of this church have entrusted me with this most sacred duty. And we, as we talked about last week when Pastor Vic walked us through the chapter in Acts, it is the most important aspect of a Sunday corporate worship gathering. It is the most important aspect of a Sunday corporate worship gathering of Christ, the preaching of the word. So all biblical aspects of worship that happen on a Sunday are important, and all ministries offered here and at other churches that glorify God are good. But to be clear, unequivocal, the biblical preaching of the word of God is most important, period. We too often evaluate churches nowadays based upon their children's ministry or uh, the quality of the worship music or how many uh, things that they offer for the youth ministry. And, you know, let me be clear that these things are good, but they're the lesser important aspects of a church. They need to take a back seat to the ministry of the word. So church, knowing Pastor Vic and the other elders as brothers, I say with absolute confidence that this church glorifies Jesus. This church glorifies Jesus. Now I'm going to ask you guys to open your Bibles to the book of Romans. As a church, we've been walking through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And today we're going to take a break, and we're going to focus on one verse, 30 words. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And the Lord has used this one verse in my life to transform me. And I pray that by his spirit and my weakness that we can do the same for you here today. I pray that he does that for you. So church, please stand with me as the tradition to honor the Lord as I read aloud from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. All right, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Church, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Y'all may be seated. All right, studying and dissecting this verse, I could preach multiple thir sermons on these 30 words. What does it mean in the past, the present, our culture, and our time, and our day and age? And what does it mean in the future to not be ashamed of the gospel? How is it that we come to believe in the gospel? What does it mean by to the Jews first and then to the Greeks symbolizing the rest of the world? But all these potential sermons, however, revolve around one central question. And that question is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Now stop and let that sink in for a second. The gospel is God's power for salvation. Now, church, if we believe that the gospel, if we believe God's word, and we believe that the gospel is God's power for salvation, we have to get it right. We must get it right. So about a year and a half ago, um, I had been doing a job for about a decade, and I got asked to take a small break and teach how to do this job. Now, I have no formal background in teaching, in education, or experience in teaching, and I struggled. So I started reading, I tried to better myself, I was talking to experts, asking questions, and one thing that I quickly learned is this. Teach the fundamentals to mastery. Teach the fundamentals to mastery. The difference between a novice and an expert is the application of the fundamentals under pressure. The application of the fundamentals under pressure. And it only comes with the strongest of grasps on them. So I am not here today to teach the fundamentals of the gospel. I am here to preach the fundamentals of the gospel. Now the difference may seem subtle, but it's anything but. Teaching is simply transferring knowledge. Preaching 
is transferring knowledge that presses for life change that can only be accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, teaching, transferring knowledge. Preaching, transferring knowledge, but pressing for life change that can only be accomplished by the work of the Holy Spirit. So, the burden that the Lord has placed on my heart for us today is this, that everyone who hears my voice may be able to biblically answer the question, what is the gospel? And that this question to your life change, that this question to this change your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you to please write a few things down today, to take notes. I prefer pen and paper personally, but if you have a phone, that's better than nothing. I will be up here for 20 minutes. And I ask you, if you are on your phone, put it in airplane mode for 20 minutes. Me personally, I even write down like the fundamental, most important truths that I have in my Bible, in, in my Bible itself. And I encourage you guys to do the same as well, if you feel led. All right, first thing I will ask you to write down is this. The gospel means good news. The word gospel means good news. It comes from a Greek word, euangelion, which translated means good news. So for your notes, first thing is the gospel means good news. Next, again, going, keeping in line with teaching the fundamentals. There is one gospel. There is one gospel. Now, it could be confusing. I remember being confused as a kid because I opened my book to the, I opened my Bible to the New Testament. And you open up the first four books of the New Testament, and it's the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But turn with me to your, in your Bible to the book of Matthew. And read for yourself what it says. It says, the gospel according to Matthew. Look at the next book, Mark. The gospel according to Mark. The gospel according to John. You see, don't be confused by this. The Bible does not teach multiple gospels. It teaches one gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit written by four men. And that offers a complete picture of what the Lord would have for us here while we're on earth. So there's one gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and church, if you are a Christian indwelt with the Holy Spirit, God has given the gospel according to you. The fundamental truths of the gospel and the message is the same, but you have a story that's unique, like a fingerprint or a snowflake that is different from everyone else. God has awakened your heart and breathed life into you and, you, and God will use your past and your encounter with him to glorify himself through the gospel according to you. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to always be prepared to give an answer. Some people's Bibles say to make a defense. Always be prepared to, to give an answer or to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is inside of you. Now, I am more and more and more convicted by the Holy Spirit that the answer or my defense to this question is the gospel according to me. It's simply my testimony that highlights the gospel in ways that are unique. So, for your notes, the gospel means good news. And there's one gospel. Now, while the gospel can be told uniquely by you, it has to contain these five essential truths. Five essential truths that a gospel must contain. So I'll go slowly so y'all can write this down. Number one, there is a God and he is holy. There is a God and he is holy. Number two, we are separated from God because of our sin. There is a God and he is holy. We are separated from God because of our sin. Number three, if you present the gospel, you must talk about the person, the life, and the death of Jesus. Number three, the person, the life, and the death of Jesus. Jesus. 
Number four, church, the resurrection of Jesus. If there was no resurrection, we have no hope. The fourth thing that a gospel presentation must contain is the resurrection of Jesus. And lastly, the fifth thing is the free offer of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. The free offer of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Now church, after our Savior was resurrected and before he ascended into heaven where he sits now enthroned and ruling. And while we await his return, he said these words found in Mark 16, 15. He said to those there and to us now today, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Church, go into the world and proclaim that there is a holy God. We are not here by circumstance, coincidence, or evolution. The world was created and is kept by a God, and so are you. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, it's important to think about and reflect upon this often, because we take it for granted. God did not have to reveal himself to us. He did not owe us this or was otherwise unfulfilled. But Jesus tells us with his own words in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. God loved the world. And that is why he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So not only did God reveal himself to us, but he came to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus, God's son, fully God, fully man, condescended from heaven and was born to a virgin. He lived a perfect life, never once sinned, and we killed him. And not only was he executed, but he went freely and peaceably, like a lamb to the slaughter, as was foretold years and years ago through the scriptures. He was brutally tortured and nailed to a cross and where he hung until he breathed his last. And his lifeless body was taken off the cross and put into a tomb. But church, death could not hold him down. And God raised him from the dead. And God looks upon the life and death and resurrection of Christ. And by placing our faith in him, God accepts Christ's perfect sacrifice as payment for my sin, for your sin. And church, this is the good news We have forgiveness of sin and can be reconciled to a holy God, not because we can earn our way there or we can work our way there, but by believing in him, by believing in him. He takes our sin, our filth, and we get his righteousness. Romans 5, 8 tells us this, that God showed his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10, 9 says, with, one, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The proclamation of the gospel demands a response. It demands a response, church. And you're either sitting there and your heart is deeply affected by hearing the gospel. Maybe even for the first time in your life, your heart is stirring and you believe or you don't. You believe that there is a holy God. You believe that we're separated from God because of our sin. You believe in the person, the death, and the life of Jesus. And you believe in his resurrection. And you accept the free offer of salvation. You couldn't deny it if you even tried to. And by grace, through faith in Christ, you repent and you believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or you don't. The proclamation of the gospel demands a response. You could reject the gospel. You either outright reject the gospel or you have no response at all. 
your heart is not moved. You see, church, you can intellectually understand the gospel. Your mind can grasp the concept of the gospel, but it must make the 18-inch journey from your head into your heart. And church, when the gospel penetrates your heart, you become indwelt with the Spirit of God. The gospel doesn't just take root in your heart, but it goes to your hands and to your feet. You will do things that you have never done before you bowed your knee to Christ. And you will stop doing things that you had done before you bowed your knee to Christ. This is only a work of the Lord. And today I want to highlight one example also of a false gospel because it's so prevalent in our time and our culture. The gospel is not an invitation to a better earthly life by the world's standards. The gospel is not an invitation to a better earthly life by the world's standards. Do not leave here thinking this. The gospel does not include a promise of health. It does not include a promise of wealth. And it does not include a promise of earthly life of ease. So Jesus actually tells us the opposite in his word multiple times. One time in John 16, 33, he says, in this life, you will have tribulation. In this life, you will have tribulation. You see, the gospel is not an invitation to a better earthly life. It's an invitation to an eternal life. Church, it's so much better than this. So when you die and you find yourself in the presence of a holy God, there will be judgment. How do you satisfy the wrath of a holy God for your life of sin? You cannot. But by grace, through faith in Christ, while you're here, you will bow before him one day and Christ's blood will cover over your sin and he will look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you will enter heaven with Jesus forever. You see, the back half of John 16, 33 is this. Jesus tells us, in this life, you will have tribulation. But then right after this, he says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So the gospel is the power of God for salvation, reconciling man with God. This is good news. But not only does God initiate and complete our salvation through the gospel, he reconciles us with him. He gives us, he gives us a place in his family. So he reconciles with us, us with him, but then he gives us a place in his family. Just think, how is this possible? How is it possible that God, excuse me, how is it possible that God not only reconciles us with him, but also calls us sons and daughters? It's through adoption, church, by adoption. We are adopted into God's family through the gospel. Now imagine for a second. Imagine that you're transgressed. And instead of, the tran instead of you demanding the transgressor being punished, you give your son as punishment. And then you accept the punishment that your son bore for forgiveness. And then you reconcile with the transgressor. And then not only do you reconcile, but you give this person a place inside your family. Like you can't even fathom this. You give this person equal inheritance, equal rights as your biological children. You see, there is no distinction in theory or practice between biological and adopted children. There are just your children that have come into your family through different means. Church, the Bible tells us in multiple places, Ephesians 1, Romans 8, 1 Peter, that those who have placed their faith in the saving work of Jesus have been adopted into God's family, and we get to call him Father. And we receive the imperishable inheritance as children. I want to highlight a family from the Redeemer Rit Network right now that's in Brazil. And they're on the tail end of a one-year journey. And they're about to bring home their three children from Brazil right now that they've adopted. And they met these children for the first time last week. 
and I received a text from them, and they sent a picture of uh, one of the three children. It was a 13-year-old boy. We'll just say his name is Johnny. And they sent a text message, and it says, Johnny is loving having a dad. I have never heard a kid say daddy so much in my life. Church, we are adopted into God's family through the gospel. Galatians 4 tells us that we are adopted, and verse 6 tells us that because you are his son, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts who calls out, Abba, Father. And just like this 13-year-old boy looking upon his adopted father, calling him Daddy, we too get to look upon God and call him Daddy in that same manner and fashion. The Lord has chosen adoption to be the clearest earthly representation of our new standing with God when we repent and believe in the gospel. I'll say again. The Lord has chosen adoption to be the clearest earthly representation of our new standing with God when we repent and believe in the gospel. Church, today, I'm preaching up here because it's Orphan Sunday. It's a day set aside not only to raise awareness of the fact that there are roughly over 150 million orphans in this world, but it's also a call to action. The gospel demands a response, and for those whose hearts it's penetrated, one of the ways that it moves to your hands and feet is by adopting a child. And what greater a picture of the gospel than adoption? And this church believes so strongly, this church believes so strongly that adoption is such a radical picture of the gospel to the watching world that if you're a member of Redeemer Bible Church and you want to adopt a child, God is calling you to adopt a child, we will pay 100% of the adoption fees. So this church, again, believes that adoption is such a radical picture of the gospel to the watching world that if God is calling you to adoption and you are a member of this church, we will pay 100% of the fees to adopt that child and bring him home. Now, church, the Bible tells us over and over not to put your Lord God to the test, but test me in this. Test me in this. Test my resolve. Test the resolve of the elders and the pastor of this church in this. I do not stand up here with a number in a bank account, worried that we can only afford five or 10 or 30 adoptions, but I pray that God has so radically gripped the heart of the members of this church that we adopt hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children. Why? For the glory of God to the watching world. For the glory of God to the watching world. Watch the Lord provide. Watch the Lord provide. The world is watching. The world is watching. And if if you are a Christian indwelt with the Holy Spirit, what you do matters. What you do matters. There Church, the answer or defense for the hope that is in me is the gospel according to me. It is my testimony that highlights the gospel in a unique way. But church, your testimony does not end when you become a Christian. You do not write down your your testimony on a paper or record it and put a period. Your testimony never ends. Now, to be clear, it's good to write down and record the way that the Lord has been faithful to you. It's It's good to record the way that the Lord has gripped your heart and you have come to him, but it never ends. It doesn't end there. It begins there. The the gospel according to me by God's grace through the Holy Spirit continues as we're called in 1 John to not only love with words and speech, but to love with action and truth. Not just words and speech, but action and truth. We will be, as the book of James tells us, we will be a doer of the word out of the overflow of the overflow of love of Christ. Not just a has dunner. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Your life hidden in Christ should always look different. Not just for one season. 
Your life hidden in Christ should always look different, not just for a season. The world is watching, church, and what you do matters. It matters for the glory of God. Now, adoption is one aspect of the orphan care ministry that my wife Alyssa and I lead here. And the Lord may not be calling you to adopt a child, but there are many ways to get involved in the caring for orphans in a sacrificial way that glorifies God. It sanctifies your soul, and it puts the gospel on display to the world in a way that nothing else can. It opens up conversations as well for people, with people. It's incredible to watch what the Lord does. And if you're interested in this, seek me out after service. I'll be over there by the bench. I can help answer any questions that you may have. Now lastly, church, before Michael comes up here and leads us in the Lord's Supper, I've had people come up to me after service and either they don't believe me when I tell them that if you're a member here and the God is calling you to adopt, we will pay 100% of your fees. They either don't believe me or they'll come up to me and say, that's the most radical thing that I've ever heard at a church service. And I stop and I remind them of this. There is a holy God. We are separated of God because of sin. I remind them of the person, the life, and the resurrection, and the death of Jesus. And then I tell them about his resurrection. And the free offer of grace, the free offer of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Church, the gospel is the most radical message ever. The gospel is the most radical message ever. That God would reconcile himself to us and then count us as sons and daughters through adoption. And I pray that your heart never becomes calloused or hardened. I pray that when the proclamation of the gospel I pray that when the gospel is proclaimed that your heart is just, has just this overflow of love. I pray that the, when the gospel is proclaimed within earshot that your eyes swell and that your heart overflows with joy and love, which emboldens you to go into the watching world and proclaim the gospel and our adoption into his family, to all of creation. All right, church, pray with me, please. Lord God, we thank you for your son. We thank you that you call us sons and daughters, Lord. And I pray that um, as your word has gone out, we know that it will not go out void, Lord Jesus. I pray that this church may be a beacon of light and hope in a dark world, Lord God. And I pray that we come and we bring and we care for orphans and widows sacrificially, Lord Jesus, for your glory. In Jesus' holy name, amen.